All right, my friends, water management protection, Build Science 201. Let's get going. Build Science 201 is sponsored by Anderson Windows and Doors, Huber Engineered Woods, and Prosico. Hey guys, I'm Matt Reisinger, and today we're diving into an essential topic for any construction project, sequencing and trades coordination. Do you know that most failures occur when the trades aren't aligned? And this is especially true at critical transition points, like where the roof meets the wall, or especially where the foundation connects the wall. These areas require careful coordination to prevent issues down the line. Oftentimes, different trades are used, different products are used, and there's different chemistries. You know, think about like basement waterproofing up against the wall where there might be a whole different type of chemistry. You might have asphaltic based below grade and water based or something else above grade. I've seen a lot of times those incompatibilities can be a problem and can lead to significant long term failures. So that's why specifying an integrated system from a very limited number of suppliers is ideal. But regardless of the system you choose, working hard to align the trades before construction or application is critical. The devil truly is in the details. For instance, in the commercial construction world, maybe not quite as much as residential, although we're seeing it more and more for fire reasons, gypsum board is used on the outside often for fire ratings. And gypsum in particular is inherently dangerous. It doesn't allow a lot of moisture to pass through it, but the smallest crack or hole that isn't properly detailed means water gets in and big problems can occur if that's your sheathing. So those details really matter. It's also vital to understand the products you're using on your project. This means knowing how they should be stored, what their ideal temperature ranges are, and any necessary substrate prep. Environmental conditions also play a huge role in getting the best performance out of your materials. So remember, effective sequencing and trade coordination can make all the difference in your projects. And a big shout out to our friends at Prosco. They make some terrific products, in particular for the outside envelope, that really work well and are really, are, frankly, easy to coordinate with your trades. Guys, I appreciate Prosco for sponsoring and thanks for watching. All right, Steve, where do we start on this issue of rainfall and mitigation? You know, when you're talking about water management and protection specifically, you really have to get in the right mindset. Mm -hmm. I threw up these two photos. This is a house I did a number of years ago. This is in Steamboat Springs, Colorado. Two things about Steamboat Springs. They do have some nice sunny days. Mm -hmm. Nice sunny days are probably, you know, maybe 10 or 15, maybe a little bit more. <laughs> Steamboat Springs, for the most of the year, yeah. looks something like that. A lot of snow, a right? lot of precipitation. And protection, a lot of times we like to talk about just what's happening off of roofs, mm -hmm. which is a really great place to start. Yep. But when you look at this, we have to protect this house from four feet of standing snow for probably about six months. Yeah, that's right. So selecting the right materials for that choice too. So as we think about this water protection and mitigation, I think the first thing that Steve and I want you to think about is where am I building? Where am I designing this house for? A house that's being built in Arizona, very different than a house that maybe I built in Portland, Oregon, where you've got a marine climate, you've got 40 inches of annual rainfall. But then we've got weird places in the country, like where I build now in Austin, Texas, we got about 35 inches of annual rainfall down here. So even though we're not a marine climate, we get a lot of annual rainfall. Now we get it in two or three inch increments, unlike when I lived in Portland where we got a quarter inch a day all winter long. So knowing where you are, what your climate zone like, and also there can be differences within a region. You know, think about building a house uh, on the top of a hill where you've got wind coming up the hill compared to a house in the flatland plain. So where you are and where your building is gonna make a big difference yep. in this water management protection. And I think, you know, to, for me to just sum it up, it's about risk assessment. That's right. Understand where you are, what's happening around you, what kind of house you want to do, assess the risk, and then design appropriately. I like that word risk assessment. Why don't you pop to that next slide, Steve, and let me use a little analogy as we think about risk assessment. You know, my company's built a lot of modern houses, Steve. Uh, no overhangs, real modern architecture. Here's one I built a couple years ago with Michael Shu Architects. Beautiful house, gorgeous. But you know, I liken this house to a house that needs a really expensive raincoat on it because it's fairly risky. I mean, if you think about that house, this is kind of the analogy of that house out in the elements for years. 
I don't have a whole lot of protection when I just have this jacket. I mean, I could easily have rain on my face that gets <laughs> into my hood. And then think about that rain shedding off. I've got my pants exposed. Now, when you build a house like this, it can be done and we did it, but I had to use the best craftsmanship, the best, most expensive materials, the best, most expensive subcontractors. There's not a lot of forgiveness in a house like this. No, and even when you look at this, look at, I mean, you have some really well-protected windows under here. Even yep. through here, yep. we have that cantilever. And then in this one, we chose to push that window out yeah. and make it even more of a challenge than, say, if we just you know cut a hole in the wall. That's right. Now, if we were building that in, let's say, L.A., where they get 15 inches of annual rainfall, not as much risk. We're building that house in Seattle, there's a lot of risk. We're building that house in Austin, Texas with 35 inches of annual rainfall, fairly risky. Or in Minnesota where you're gonna get ice and stuff sitting on there yep. and challenging you. Now, not to say you can't do it, we have, but it does mean that you're gonna spend a lot more money, it's gonna be more difficult, and you've got less forgiveness built into the architecture. So this house, also very modern, but interesting, the architect, Hugh Jefferson Randolph, added some protection in various places. And I would liken that to adding a little bit of a baseball cap on some of the areas that needed a little bit more forgiveness. So we've got a projection on those windows on the right. Up there. We've got a projection on the top. You know, we've added a baseball cap. It's still risky, uh, still not a whole lot of forgiveness built in. I still gotta use awesome materials and subs and I gotta get everything just right, but it can be done. So that's a little bit like this analogy. And one of the things about this, you know, for your climate, these are all flat roofs, right? One of the things about protection is not only protecting the window, but getting rid of that water as fast as we can. That's right. So if you're moving to a location that has a lot more rainfall, then you might want to consider, maybe it's not a flat roof, it's a really low sloping roof, but we want to get rid of that water. That's right. The pitch roofs have more forgiveness built right in because we've got gravity on our side. Now here's an interesting house, Steve. It's got a pitched roof, right? It kind of looks traditional. I did not build this. This is a remodel in, in Austin I thought was a good looking house. But if you look at that house, uh, it has a pitched roof, it has some gutters, but it also has a fair amount of uh, kind of risky areas that need to be done. Look at those windows right in the center of the house. You got a turn gable right there in the front of the house and water falling down means that that top window is pretty exposed and the bottom window is probably even more exposed. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, that's even more exposed. It's got twice the amount of wall above it than here. Yep. But it's really interesting that the architect or the builder, they cared about people because mm -hmm. when you're standing here, you have a canopy there. Yeah, they put an awning over there. So again, it can be done, can be made waterproof, and we can manage that water, but it's a lot harder. It's a riskier assembly. This is a house I rebuilt from the 1960s. This is Weber Studios Architects. Uh, the front of the house is basically the same as you see from the 60s. The roof overhang, the projections are the same, the brick is original. Now we kind of redid that whole center section and modernized it. But I think this is an interesting example of a house that didn't just have a raincoat on, it had an umbrella. I mean, if you look yeah, at that these projection, are great distances there. those are literally six foot overhangs on the house. So the house had one of these on. It had a golf umbrella, right? Now, if I have a golf umbrella on, Steve, am I worried about having the most expensive raincoat on? No. I mean, my, unless it's blowing 40 miles an hour while it's windy, I'm not gonna get any rain on my face. I don't even care about wearing a hat at this point. I don't even need my, my hood up. Now, I might still get some splashback on my feet, but interestingly enough, this house with those giant six foot projections, I was really worried when the client came to me and said we wanted to remodel. I said, you know, we might have to take all this brick down and mitigate and do some things to, uh, to fix. Turns out, I took the sheetrock off on the inside the original plywood and drywall were in perfect condition. There was no issues whatsoever. That giant umbrella saved this house. So even when I remodeled it 60, 70 years after it was built, zero problems with water management. So this is a project, this is actually the first passive house I ever did. This was probably about 2010, this photo was taken. The reason I threw this up here was, you know, the idea of just like your remodeling project, using architecture to provide protection. You know, every window here and every door is protected by some type of roof overhang. And the one that's, ones that actually have people are a little larger, like the front porch. Mm -hmm. 
right? So, I mean, it's just a, a real classic example of using architecture to solve the protection problem. Makes a lot of sense, Dave. I really like that. You know, front porches. These are things that have been around since as long as we've been building houses. Mm -hmm. But somehow we, you know, we've kind of shied away. Oh, they cost a little bit more, but they, you know, beyond being that nice inviting space, they're a space where people can come in out of the rain, be welcomed, and they protect the house. Yeah, I mean, that adds so much forgiveness to the front door and those windows that it doesn't matter what kind of flashing, what kind of weather sealing, those could be the original windows that are 100 years old. They're never going to see rot because they're never going to get wet. Right. So lots of protection there. And this is just another example of an entryway, but this is negative space as opposed to the previous one mm -hmm. that was something that was added on as positive space. So they can be done either way. And this, you know, we're probably talking on the order of about five, six feet there. Negative. That's interesting. I haven't heard that. That seems like a good architect term. I like that where it kind of pushes back into the house and the front is still continuous. You don't have this porch projection. That's cool, Steve. I like that design. And this is the back of the house. This one here is just showing some architectural elements where we've bumped out this bay to help protect that slider. Smart. We have two foot overhangs that you can see trace around the whole house. Those protect all of those windows. So again, it's using those architectural features of, hey, if we need a little bit more room in the dining room, yeah, let's bump that out. We don't have to bump out the downstairs and actually there's a benefit to using that. And I would also go back to where your house is located here. You know, if this house was facing south and west uh, in my climate zone, that's where the weather typically comes from. And you can find that out for your zone as well with a quick Google search. But if you're building a house in Austin, usually the wind and the water are coming from the south and the west. That's also where the sun uh, gets the most exposure on an annual basis. So having that first floor have some extra protection because it's down from that overhang by uh, you know a significant amount. If those are 10 foot ceilings, that could be 20 feet below that overhang. That means that maybe I have an umbrella up uh, for that overhang, but that umbrella is really high, right? And so if that umbrella is way higher than my house, I'm struggling to get my umbrella up. Here we go. I need a push button. If my umbrella is way up here. It's not going to protect me nearly as well. Just a little bit of wind and all of a sudden I'm getting wet. Now, on the other hand, if I bring that umbrella down here, I'm way more protected. Yeah. And we're going to talk about that because we have a good slides. I have a term, you know, the aspect ratio of water management. Ooh, so I like that. We'll talk about it. But this is just another example. This is the wraparound porch, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, every window slider there is protected by that five foot overhang. Yeah, I love that. That's great architecture. Aspect ratio. Like you said, if we make something taller, just like you showed with the umbrella, then we have to move from a regular umbrella to the golf umbrella. There you go. Right, and so this wants to be proportional to that height there. And, and what is the proportion size on that? Or do you have any rule of thumb? For I mean, I, I like at least one to one here, but I mean, for this one here, this is a kind of an exaggerated condition. I believe this is probably on the order of 12 feet and that's about five feet, okay. five and a half feet, so. So you're getting closer. It, we're getting to closer one -to, -one. to it, but I think we the next one here, so this is a traditional house, and this is that kind of one-to-one -one approach, Yep. right? So the height from the window to the soffit, and then this out there, you know, that one-to-one. -one. So in other words, if you're two feet down from the soffit, we want to see at least a one-foot projection on that soffit to make right. sure that we've got some good coverage on that window. Yeah. I've done a number of water testing. Most windows leak at the head, mm -hmm. and I just so happen to drive up to this picture and say, you know, there is a God, and uh, he gave me this photo. <laughs> because I couldn't have drawn or photoshopped a better photo yeah. illustrating the idea of protection. We've got a two-foot overhang, let's say it looks like on that house. Yep. Uh, also notice there's no gutters on this house. We do have a metal roof, which is really going to shoot that water out nicely. Yep. Uh, and the top, I don't know, four or five feet underneath the soffit, Looks like the day it was installed. Yeah. Absolutely beautiful. Those windows are highly protected. Interesting to note though, Steve, at the bottom of the house, just like my analogy of my feet maybe getting wet, even though I've got a raincoat on, you can tell there's a, there's been a little bit of water at yep. this rain event that happened recently and splashing back. Yeah. Now that could be solved by adding gutters there. We can also do some things to mitigate that under construction. We're gonna get into that in a, in a later detail, but in all my years of remodeling, 
almost all the rot that I find, at least the major rot, is in the bottom 18 inches of the house. That's where that splashback causes damage over time. Yeah, and Peter and I, Peter Yost, we've done a number of uh, times where we've tested here with a uh, moisture meter and then tested here and found that in about three or four feet, we can get twice as much moisture content. Yeah, it makes sense. In the lower part of the it's wall. It's being protected up higher. So this one here is breaking down those elements again, talking about risk. This is that house that we talked about earlier. Not only do we have the two foot overhang, but by having a headpiece here and a little drip line there, these windows are really well protected. Mm -hmm. And you know, the when we're talking about risk assessment, this house is right on the Atlantic Ocean. So this is Oof. not something that's, you know, not a house that's gonna, yeah, it might see rain and you know, now and then. No. <laughs> this is gonna see torrential rain, downpours and wind. wind throwing it out against the house, yeah. right? So having that, and you can see here, we're probably more like two to one mm -hmm. there. So advancing that um, uh, aspect ratio for our risk. And then this is a passive house, and we're talking probably about 18 inches there. I mean, you could get away with just taping that window. Mm -hmm. But that's really not the story here. The story is here that while we removed the head from risk, we've put the sill in a much higher risk. Yeah, that's right. So now we have to solve for that. So risk assessment isn't only about the house, the location, it is the component, where the component is in the wall, and all of a sudden, if I solve for one, chances are it made something else worse or more of a higher risk. And let me point out that that's not a flat sill like you might see on those windows above. Right. Uh, that's a sloped sill because you knew, hey, I'm recessing this back, so let's add a sloped yeah. sill with lots of slope, an exaggerated slope, yeah. really. And this pan folds up along the sides oh, that's on awesome. both sides. So it is basically a rain chute that's really of smart. a sill. I like that. And just another photo. It's a small component. You sit there and say, okay, big deal, Steve. This is the you know AC lines going in and such, but everything matters when it comes to water. Water doesn't sit there and say, well, I'm only gonna leak where the windows are or at the top of a door. No, it is gonna leak anywhere where I have a pressure difference and a hole. I'd like to point out, look at that. It's a little hard to tell because it's white in this photo, but look at that beautiful head flashing. Any water that's running down those shingles is gonna hit you that head flashing. Down. That head flashing is gonna direct it out. And then you've got that really nice air conditioning boot on there for the line sets, which is gonna protect those line sets much better than a tape or a caulking would. Uh, that's a physical protection for that space. Right. So that's just another great example of protection when it comes to water. And it continues down here. We had, I just noticed we have that, you know, we have that little water table that kicks down. That keeps water from turning the corner and getting back at the foundation. Fantastic. All right, Steve, water management protection. Give us a quick summary. You know, when it comes to water, protection is number one for me. If I don't want to have a water leak, I should choose to get rid of the water and don't it. get challenged. It's, it. it is that simple, but it's still the number one killer of buildings. And I think it's fitting that Steve's talking about this as an architect. You know, I'm not an architect. I build lots of different things for lots of different architects. So I have to kind of take what I'm given, but it really starts with the architect. And this is something you can coach your clients on too. I mean, if we're going to build a risky house, we're gonna spend more money. We're gonna to have to really aim for perfection. Whereas when we build a less risky house, we've got forgiveness built into the house. And I really like that, but I've made lots of mistakes in my career on waterproofing, on water management, risky houses, and I've paid the price for that. And that's part of why I'm doing this series is I want you as that younger builder, that younger architect to learn from the wisdom of Steve and I. Don't make these same mistakes. Let's start with a less risky building to begin with. Guys, this was Water Protection. Stay tuned for our next episode, which is Water Mitigation. See you next time on The Build Show. Sponsored by Anderson Windows and Doors, Huber Engineered Woods, and Prosico. This is Build Science 201.